Thank you everyone for coming and thank you for the wonderful introduction to what is active learning, what is student-centered learning, and why we want to move away from maybe the traditional courses that aren't really effective for students. And we're going to talk about we're going to talk about why those courses aren't that typical traditional approach. I can't have it translating my words into Spanish and hear them at the same time, so excuse me. Um, a couple of things I want to start with is I wanted to point out that myself, Luana Gomez, and jo Jeff Saul, you might be wondering why are a bunch of physicists here talking about active engagement, student-centered classroom, learning environments? Well, part of the reason is, is that all three of us obtained our PhDs in what is, um, what is now referred to as discipline-based education research, which means our PhDs are in the discipline, but our research focused on um, educational topics. For example, mine was on enhancing college students' understanding of lunar phases so we can more effectively teach it. Um, Jeff focused on doing, I was going to say, Jeff, you want to share? Evaluating research-based instruction methods uh, compared to traditional lecture by looking at the hidden curriculum, the dimensions of teachings that we sometimes don't look at. And this, in this particular case, we were looking at the dimensions of conceptual understanding and cognitive beliefs about how to learn, what physics is, what I, and what students need to do to learn it. All right, thank you, Jeff. Luana? My research was based, well, I guess it has three elements. One is investigations on student learning and how to teach it effectively. And the po student population were uh, prospective engineers, uh, engineering majors, and also pre-service and in-service teachers of physical science. Um, in particular, I looked at student understanding of introductory calculus-based physics and also looked at student understanding beyond introductory physics. I looked at introductory uh, engineering courses that were where introductory physics is the underlying uh, foundation for their learning. I've also done curriculum development and quite a bit of assessment. Thank you both for sharing. That's not the answer. Why do we have a bunch of physicists here telling you? Well, what it is is that all three of us have over 20 years experience in these research fields but almost every single one of us started teaching in a student-centered approach, active learning engagement classroom. For example, the classroom that you're in right now, we quaintly refer to as a scale-up room, um, which Jeff's postdoc advisor, Bob Beekner, and a mentor of mine in Luana's, actually designed as a way to actually create this environment, this way for students to work together to learn the material, things like that. And so what we're gonna do today is I want to start with, we're going to have six diff or five different sessions over the next two days. I invite everybody to attend all of them. The first one here is about going from a student-centered course to a, or from an instructor-centered course to a, to a student-centered course. Why we want to go and why we want to put the focus on the student's learning. The second one is going to be on how to do assessments, like how do you figure out what students know and don't know and how do you uh, follow up on that, which will be done by Jeff uh, next after me, and then uh, this afternoon I'm going to be coming back and talking about evaluations and how, what if your students aren't liking it, or how do you show that active learning is working? Because a lot of times most of evaluation methods that we use are somewhat subjective, like course teaching evaluations. You know, if the students don't like it because you're making them work, what is actually happening, what are different things we can focus on, and how we can assess them differently, or evaluate them differently. Uh, then tomorrow morning we're going to talk more about active learning. Active learning and student-centered classrooms are very tightly connected. So this is sort of the whole focus of what's going on. And then in the afternoon, uh, depending on what kind of situation you want to do more active learning in, like if I'm stuck teaching in a lecture hall, well, I'm going to, be giving a, going to be talking to you on how we can do active learning in a lecture hall. And just so you know, I have done active, active learning in a about 360-seat lecture hall and had it actually work and improve student learning. So 
that's one option, and I'll be talking about things like that. Um, Jeff will be talking about actually having these classrooms scale up. So what kind of learning can you do in this? Why are they designed this way? How is it actually happening? And then Luana is going to be talking about when you go into an active learning room, where you have these unbelievably wonderful chairs. We are so jealous of these chairs. I, like sh I was at a conference last week, and I presented a poster where I took an image of, that I took off your website of students learning in an active learning classroom where they had these chairs, and they could be in group together, or they could be in a lecture forum. And a lot of the people that were at the conference goes, I want those chairs. <laughs> so we're going to be doing that. And then that will be the wrap-up for that portion of our seminar. But today I want to start with the shifting the focus, moving from a teacher-centered approach to a student-centered approach. I want to first off apologize that I do not speak Spanish, but the translation seems to be working extreme, extremely well. Uh, the other thing I would like to apologize for is I didn't know exactly how to time this because of the fact that I didn't know how the translations were going to work and how much we're going to be able to interact with each other back and forth. But it sounds like it, that's not going to be as much of a problem. Um, but I think we should still be on time for going to, one, to 11 o'clock. Uh, um, so I'm going to get started with what the outline of my talk is going to or what this is. So we're going to be doing this interactive workshop where I'm going to be talking a little bit. You guys are going to be working together. You guys are going to be coming up with the answers. I want you to realize what I'm modeling here is how an active engagement classroom, a student-centered classroom works. Notice who's doing the talking, notice who is doing the listening, what is happening with this, what's going on, what the role of the instructor is. Am I always, notice I'm sort of slowly turning around. Uh, that is because there is no true front to this room. I mean, you could say oh, over here or over there, but it's not really a true front. The idea is that you should be able to be able to view everybody on the 12 different screens around the room, or however many there are, there aren't 12, um, but talk about that. So the first part I want to talk about, is there a disconnect between how you're teaching and what your students are learning? Are they learning what you want to be doing? Then how can we fix that disconnect? And then I'm going to talk about an overview of instructor sending courses. Why don't they work? Or why, aren't they the le why are they the least effective? Um, and then the question is, is lecture always bad? And that is a good question because a lot of people say, but, but, but I, need to I need to tell them things. I need to introduce a concept. I need to do these things. Um, then I'm going to give an overview of student-centered courses. Do you just let them go free? Oh my gosh, how do you like, keep control of the class? How do you keep them focused? What is going on with that? Because it's like, how's that going to happen? I mean, um, and then I'm going to talk about what an activity two is, what type of transition you want to make. And we're going to talk about, ask you some questions, and then we're going to use those answers to questions to sort of uh, pull together and regroup a little bit. So you can talk to people that are in the same kind of, that are in the same case as you. I want to do this massive, huge transformation. I have to teach in these scale-up classrooms. My students are going to do this, and I'm going to teach in it. Not sure what we're going to cover, but we're going to make sure make it work. Or to other people saying, I'm really not sure. What can I do in my class tomorrow that will help me uh, implement some of these active learning strategies, student-centered strategies? And then we're going to finally, um, that's also going to transition to student center course, give some more discussion output, and then also general conclusions and question and answer time. Are there any, excuse me, any questions about the overview of the courses or the talk? Hands up, that kind of thing. All right. Unfortunately, we didn't have the technology um, to do necessary clicker questions. So I want to talk about what our first activity is. Is there a disconnect between how you are teaching and what students are learning. How many people think there's a disconnect? Can you just raise your hands? Mm, about 40% about close. How many people wish their students could learn more? Or they could do more after you teach them? So you're somewhat disappointed with how much they can do. All right. So here are a few questions for you. We're going to do this a little differently. All right. Who does the most amount of talking in your course? A, myself. The way we're going to do this is what I call the poor man's raid to doing clicker questions when they're not hooked. That's where we're lacking the technology. 
So 1 for A, 2 for B, 3 for C, 4 for D, and 5 for E. So for example, A is myself. I do the talking, I need 100% of the time. Maybe the students, I ask students questions, but they don't answer, and I give them the answer right away. Or 75% me, and then sometimes students ask questions, or they answer questions in class. But really, it's all me doing the stuff. And there seems to be an equal mix of me and my students talking. Or, well, I don't actually talk a lot. The students actually do most of the talking. They're either working in teams to come up with a solution to problems, or they're doing something, or they're asking me questions, or they're focusing on what's happening. Or the students do all the talking. I just go in there. I don't even tell them anything. I just walk in the morning. They put up my slides, and they know what to do. OK, so how many people are A? Anybody's A talking all the time? Come on, come on. OK, so we got two people, three people, four people that are five people. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And 10, about 25% of the group here is saying, yeah, I talk most of the time. What about 75% you talking? Okay, we got some more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So we're a little bit more saying, okay, I did the majority of teaching. How about equal mix between the instructor and the students? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Are people answering the same different answers twice? It's okay. It's okay. I'm just asking. Say, sorry, I missed you as well. So we're trying to do this. So maybe you shift between some days I talk most of the time and other days I let the students do all the talking. What about students always do more than more of the talking? <laughs> Luana, Jeff, and I are like, oh, and Claudia as well. We're all ha holding our hands up. OK, why are we doing that? What about students do all of the talking? I don't come in. I don't say a word. I don't do anything. I want you to notice here there are a wide variety of percentages of doing talking. Now, students, even if they're doing the majority of the talking, they still need an instructor to guide them. An instructor that's going to help them figure out what's going on. Sometimes they're going to just introduce a concept or something, or they're introducing questions that the <laughs> students don't know the answer to. But they want to be able to students to work together to figure out these answers. OK, another question. Sorry, I got this before. How many, student, how many people are very satisfied with how, what your students, how your student performs compared to how you would like them to perform? How many people are 100% satisfied with this? OK, good. You have a reason to be here. How many are pretty satisfied? Couple, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So you're all about, hey, I want some hints, what I can do to maybe do this improvement. What about people that are neutral? Not satisfied, not, it's OK, yeah. OK, what about people that are pretty ups dissatisfied, how much their students are learning compared to how much they think they should be able to do? One, anybody else? Thank you for being brave. <laughs> Two, three, four. See, once somebody does it, five, six. Once somebody raises their hand, more people participate. Seven, thank you. I want you to note this, because this is something that happens in a classroom. You do it, nobody does anything. But did I answer the question for them? No, I waited. One person volunteered, and all of a sudden, seven more people volunteered. OK, how many people are really upset with how much their students are learning as compared to? what they would like them to learn, or how much they're getting out of it. Anybody? Well, I'm going to tell you my experience. Oh, did you have your hand up? No, I'm sorry. So I'm going to tell you experience of things that I had happened in physics class. How many people think physics is hard? Physics is hard? Not for you. I don't want to, oh, you guys, you know, you do this. It's crazy, it's hard math. That's like torture, that's a killer course, that's horrible. Anyway, so you go into a class, you're taking this course, and you take your first exam. And it's out of 100 points. What should the average be, do you think? I mean, the, and the average in the course is 50%. What does that make you feel like? You got a 50% on this exam. 
Does that make you feel good? Mm -mm. What, what in general does it make, do you feel like you failed? Because technically you only got half the questions right. I think this is a major disconnect that happens in physics in the United States. So it's like, well, we have to be able to do the whole span of possibilities. And so we'll have an, we'll have an average of 50%, but we'll, we'll, we'll up it at the end, you know, if we have to. We're not going to curve it, but we may say, okay, that's a good score. So the people who got 50% are getting Bs. People who got above 50% are getting As. People who are getting below or right around 50% are getting Cs or Bs. Below that, Ds and Fs, this kind of thing. It's a disconnect that the instructors have because if, if the average on an exam is 50%, then the instructor did something wrong. They either asked, asked too hard of questions or they actually um, did not teach the subject. So this is the kind of thing that might happen. So I want you guys to actually, I'm going to have you guys group into teams, of, oh, where'd the lights go? Okay. Uh, teams of three. Okay, the reason, if you notice, each of the tables have seat, nine seats. So I want to have, um, now, I got to keep, I keep counting to see if we are divisible by three. If not, we'll have a couple of groups of four. So let's just, this is what I call chaos reigning. Let's get up, move around if we have to, and spread out and have teams of three. They need one person over here, you have an extra person. No, you don't. You have to do good. Good. Good, good. Good. Uh, we need one more person over there in the back table. You've got two, so they need one more person back there if you want to go over there. Great. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Great. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We need one person. You go over there. We got three. And you only have two here? Are you joining them? Okay, great. All right. Now I could set you on a task and a question to answer. But do you know the people next to you? Do you know the people that are in your team? Have you met them before? Seen them across campus? So what I want you to do is take five minutes and I want you to introduce yourself to your team and say, hi, my name is and I am a physics professor, or I am interested in this, I'm an art professor, I'm a teacher, different things like that. So uh, we want to do this, and so, uh, and so I say you might want to have a little diversity in there, but I'm thinking if you don't know each other, you probably do have diversity, simply because of the fact that if you're all in the same department, you'd all know each other. So let's just get down, three, 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 three. All right, let's take five minutes and introduce yourself. Yes. Do you have your mic on? I think so. <laughs> Can they? So, uh, you're going to give them about five minutes? Or? Oh, okay. What are you, me number? You send him. I want to let this chaos reign. People moving around the class and doing things. I'm going to tell you, 100% of the time, it's going to be worth it. You've got to let go and let go of the control. And we'll talk. And you got to just be saying, okay, I'm not in charge anymore. I got to let the students focus and students <coughs> learning. Now, I didn't have you answer your question, so let me do my thing. Okay, so we meet your team, brainstorm. So I want you guys to talk about why might your expectations be different from your, how your students or what your students learn. And I want you to use whiteboards. So every team should have a whiteboard. I know they pass around the huddle boards. And I don't know if every team has, I think there's, they need another one here at this table, Jeff. Uh, how many huddle boards do you have in the back? Two? We need one more back there. And we need two more back there. And we need, then we're good. Two, another one up here. So if you need a huddle board, raise your hand. Or just have the whole team raise their hand. We're out. Oh, we're out. We don't have enough huddle boards for the entire classroom. Is there another place we can get huddle boards? Back here. Back here. 
Okay, if you don't have a huddle board, use the dry erase boards on the back wall, on the side walls. Notice they have them, so make sure the huddle board, so these folks need, need a huddle board because you guys can spill it up on the different, you know, just work on the sides of the thing. What's, Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I meant this one. Yes. Okay. If you are on one of the back tables or tables over on that side of the room, please go up and discuss this and list your ideas on the whiteboard back here. Now, um, what I want you to do is, you gotta be prepared. When we get done with this, I'm gonna ask you guys to share this in, um, and with the whole class, or the whole groups. So, be prepared to share. <laughs> and be prepared to discuss. So you guys need to come, what it is, is you need to, need to brainstorm and come to a consensus of what you think is, um, why you think, or basically why your expectation may be disconnected from why your students are Just think of a reason or reasons. huddle boards here, so can we have you uh, use the board back here to write your suit? And then, um, yes, this one is, I think it's easier for you guys to get up than for them to get up. Los profesores somos muy aburridos. Entonces, los estudiantes se distraen porque es que a veces... O sea, cuando yo me pongo en el lugar de estudiante, yo digo, pero es que es mucho rato y hablan, en, los profesores muchas veces, hablamos en unos tonos, no motivamos, no contamos historias, pues no les hacemos el aprendizaje más cercano. Entonces yo creo que hay mucha parte del lado de allá, pero yo también creo que hay mucha parte del lado de acá. Listo, muchas gracias. to you and then we need to move uh, yes <laughs> okay next oh so I, I just wanted to add uh, one of our thoughts in this and is the the lack of flexibility in assessment and evaluation uh, just to bring that to the discussion because I think that's really important. We mainly have just one form of, of assessing students and I think it's worth to, ta to look at it as well. Uh, thank you. We have like the um, Notice also that uh, here we have the culture of non-participating from the students. So the average of students is always quiet. You ask a question and they are quiet. And the ones that want to participate, they feel like pressure, maybe kind of bullying if they are very active because they will, will, will be the only ones participating. So they have like the pressure of the classroom of not being like the, the one we want them to be. in Spanish. <laughs> bueno, eh, nosotros también eh, tenemos uno que de pronto no se ha mencionado y es el reconocimiento del profesor como autoridad en el salón y por tanto como el respeto hacia el docente, la experiencia que él tiene, el conocimiento, porque son como con una actitud retadora y con una actitud como de yo soy cliente más que estudiante. 
no se pierde como ese papel de estudiante y se ponen en el papel de cliente hacia una exigencia como si uno les debiera algo y no es que uno les deba sino que uno está al servicio y ellos no quieren recibir ese servicio entonces es también como y eso es como con la generación es, es esa, esa falta de respeto, de disciplina hacia el profesor de, de reconocimiento de todos los años que lleva estudiando y preparando el tema entonces eso también afecta mucho el tema de la conexión Ok, I'm sorry or, uh, I want to comment on that comment but Uh, part of what I'm doing, if you notice, what I'm doing as I'm going through here is I'm trying to manage the discussion somewhat. I'm only allowing a certain amount of time for this because I know I have other things I want to accomplish in before uh, we wrap up in 45 minutes. And so we may have more time for discussion at the end and question and answers. That's my hope. And I um, also want to give you a little bit of a break for those people who are leaving and coming in for the next session and things like that. So, as for the last comment, this idea of students approaching it as clients and not respecting the faculty. Part of it is a different way. I mean, part of it is you have to have this interaction between the faculty and the students. And yes, it needs to be respect-based. But it's also that respect needs to go both ways. That they're here, they're intelligent adults, they made it into college. Does everybody who applies here get in? So everybody the university there's no selection? Do they get in the major they want? Do they all get into the university? If I apply to this university, am I guaranteed acceptance? No, I've got a bunch of no's. So if I'm an average high school graduate and I want to come to school here, do I, all get, do I always get in? So there's some kind of standards that allow the students they go through, and they're smart enough to make it through that before they can actually start here at EFIT. So we need to take, remember that and treat our students with respect. Now, notice one of the things that I did with you guys is I let you guys spend the time talking about it. I have to be flexible enough to realize you needed a little bit more time. Everyone wanted to talk more and everyone wanted to share more because we have to allow for the time to do that. That's a very much of a loss of control on the instructor's part. That's one of the big things that people fear. They fear losing that control. They fear being able to say, hey, this is what's happening. And unfortunately, yes, it's disappointing that I had to cut you off and say, okay, we've got to end the discussion now. But you do it and the students say, okay, they may, they may want to have a discussion with you later. They'll come up and talk to you after class. Different things like that will happen. So it's, it's unfortunately one of those things that just goes along with having this. You've got to have very good time management skills with doing this. And so I want to go on to my next slide, which is, because this actually worked out very, very well, and you're getting a lot of progress into what this idea of this disconnect is. So I want to focus a little bit more on the uh, instructor-centered kind of classroom and some of the re other reasons that the research and what we're thinking in my experience is said why the lecture doesn't work 100% of the time. Now, I'm not saying you have to eliminate lecture. I wanted to make that clear. You may just want to shift more of that responsibility onto the students. Allow them to talk and interact. So, okay. So, instructor center courses are, they're typified with the majority of time is dominated by the instructor. Remember everybody who raised their hand and said, I do most of the talking? Me? I do it? It's all about how much, yes. You agree. Got it. So how do, you know, we're doing all this talking. So is it respectful if a student actually interrupts you to ask a question? Some professor, no, you say no. Do the students feel comfortable interrupting you to ask a question? As you said, it might be like bullying if they answer. Other people may look, I can't believe they're asking a question again. Man, they just are so slow. Or you think that's what the people are going to think of you. What's really happening is, oh, thank God somebody asked that. I really, I really wanted to ask that, but I just, I'm a little scared. It's sort of intimidating. There's all these people in this room. I don't know them. I'm like, you know, maybe I'm only one of only a certain type of population, like I'm the only woman, or I'm the only uh, English speaking. 
uh, U.S. citizen in here, but I want to be coming here to Columbia and, and going to EFIT and learning from it, and I want an exchange program. Things like that are happening. So a lot of times, lecturing is what the professor does. Do you guys know about, um, do you know who the Peanuts, Peanuts com comic is, like Snoopy? You all know who I'm talking about? Charlie Brown, the whole thing. Well, they go to school, and their teacher talks. What's their teacher say? <laughs> That's what our students hear a lot of the time when you're lecturing. It's a disconnect, and they don't actually process the information. I mean, sometimes many students ask, may ask students questions. Here's another issue that happens. Okay. Hmm. So I'm thinking about going to a restaurant for dinner tonight, and now that's too easy of a question. I want something that's sort of like, okay, so we just covered why we have lunar eclipses. So what phase of the moon should it be? Is it going to be in when we have the solar eclipse in the United States in three weeks? Okay, the answer is, did I allow you time to think about it and answer the question? This is very, very common. Because the thing is that when we're in front of a classroom, we think that time goes so slow because we're sitting up here. Where is it? Okay, what I do and what many instructors do is we do the count to 12. And I like to do the 12 being 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. That's how we were taught to count seconds when I was a child. So while we're waiting for students' answers, I'm walking around the classroom. I'm sort of looking at people, making eye contact, making sure that I'm involving the entire class, not just the front row students. Um, in my courses, we're going to talk about more of this tomorrow when I do lecture courses, I put in a small percentage of their points in the class's participation to get them to encourage them to answer my questions when I say these things. So I may be able to ask them a question, but then we have this disconnect. If a student asks a question, do you ever have the situation where a student asks a question, but they still seem confused to know what's happening, so what you do is you just repeat the question louder and slower? Because they obviously didn't understand you. Does that work? Not really. Louder? So what do you have to do when you do this? You have to figure, you have to work with that person individually, but you don't want to take the course time around lecture because you have to get through this stuff today. And you have to be able to make sure that you do that because it's going to be on the test a week from Thursday. And you got to make sure, and, and you have to teach this content because this other group of students is required to take this course so they can move on in their program. So you have to make sure everything gets covered. Boom, 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 I don't have time to do this. Um, so these students get sort of frustrated. They're not doing as much to learn. They're getting this, I don't really, you know. And one of the things that happens is, um, this is a common thing that I heard in one of my education classes. One of the first things in my first, very first education class, um, back when I was at the University of Toledo, I said, the instructor is talking, but are the students learning? So when you're in front of the students, you have to see, are they learning, are they, what are, you, what are signs of interest, what are signs of disconnect? If they're not paying attention, what are things they're having, or frustration? Um, now, most of this kind of thing, we're going to talk about formative and summative assessments. Jeff is going to talk about that in the next presentation. But anyway, I want to talk about, okay, this is something to remind yourself again and again. Am I talking too much? Are my students learning? Can I pay attention to this? What are the signs that I think my students are learning? Notice I'm looking around the room, making eye contact, seeing what everybody's doing, seeing who's writing, see who's looking up at me, see if anybody is sort of staring off in the corner and reading the paper, or looking at the web, uh, something like that, the webcam or doing anything. OK, so here are some of the problems. This is where we bring in the research. So educational research and many studies say, OK, it's not this instant transmission model where I magically lay my hands on her head and I'm talking and she picks this up and she understands it and she'll be ready for the test tomorrow. We all know that's not going to happen, right? So there's things, basically students have to process this information that you give them. They have to be able to figure it out, connect it to other knowledge, 
connected to their previous knowledge and work from there. And so a lot of times um, what happens in a student center, a typical instructor student course, the teacher's up there talking, maybe PowerPoint slides, maybe not, and the students are frantically writing, and they're writing, and they're writing, and they're writing, and they're trying to get everything done. And they're trying to maintain the pace of the structure. Have you ever had one of those professors that they just talk a mile a minute, and you can't understand what they're saying, and you just want to say, wait, I'm lost, help, stop. And um, so you might do that, and then you take these notes home, and you're trying to make sense of it. You might have a question, but you, know, you have that question right at that moment. You think you figure it out. Do you go and check to see if you really figured it out? Maybe it's an obvious thing that you know is going to be on the test, but not all the time. And so what it ends up having is does the sense of confusion or this lack of mastery. The other thing students do is they want to memorize all the answers. They think if they memorize the notes, they can then answer all the questions that will be on the test. We'll talk about that in a minute here. So anyway, I want you to talk about this idea of research and this processing. Well, it turns out often when you're trying to do lectures and doing this instructor-centered lecture, it takes too much for students, too much many cognitive resources. It breaks down and they can't do this as well as you would think. So here's an example. Imagine Luana, where are you, Luana? Or Luana is a student in your course. Luana is your average student. She's come from high school. She has many different interests. She has many different clubs that she's part of and many different goals of why she's taking the course. So being a typical student, she's got about 10 resources. I'm just saying, imagine she has 10 resources, 10, 10 bottles of water, or 10 bottles. You all have water bottles, so we can collect the 10. And these are only resources she takes only resources she has. And so what happens is, OK, I need to listen. So she's going to need two bottles of water to listen. So those go away. OK, then she's got to have four resources to write these lecture notes because the professor is talking really, really fast. It's on content that she may not know as much about it. She, she needs four resources to process info. and. She resources to then try and connect that information to her previous understanding and be able to process it to a state where she can ask an intelligent question. How many does this total up to? Twelve. The total is twelve. So what's actually lacking? What happens in the classroom? This last thing, the two resources for connecting to previous learning and other things and processing it, that, and the process information and the resource um, the amount of time she can spend or the resources she has to spend on processing it and relating to previous learning goes way down. So she's not doing that in the classroom. One of the other things that happens is maybe she does all the resources. She writes everything down. She's got it. Oh, I've got this covered. I know all this material. Left and right, I've got this covered. Goes in and takes her first test. Fails her first test horribly because she didn't have it covered. So continuing with this, so I want to talk about many things can reduce the amount of resources she can spend on processing this. Things like, what if the speaker is like me, who's speaking English, and you're not a native English speaker? Or in my case, I'm sitting here, and I'm not a native Spanish speaker. Um, and so maybe the content is really, really, really difficult. And, that, and that's happening, and she can't actually pull things together. So the more difficult it is, the more she can't do it. And then there's this idea of assimilation versus accommodation. So if you get new knowledge, and your knowledge is very similar to what you have previously and what you already know, you can, what we call, assimilate it. We can just grab it in, put it in, just uh, fold it in, firm place it's in. I like to think of, um, you guys are familiar with Star Trek and the Borg and Star Trek Next Generation. And you have this Borg, big cube Borg going around and he'd, they'd sort of assimilate all these new cultures and the cultures had to change to be, you know, they were assimilated in. It's an easy process because they were invaders. Sorry if you didn't get the reference, uh, but you do that. 
So some researchers say, well, the only kind of thing they can do with this information is actually just focus on memorizing. And the lecture is good for transferring information that's easily memorized. But if you want to go to higher order thinking skills, you've got to go towards more in-depth types of learning-centered approaches. So I wanted to point out here, um, this is a common thing. How many people have heard of this before, Bloom's taxonomy? Mm. See, I turn around and people start raising their hands. It's great. <laughs> okay, Bloom's taxonomy, about half of you have heard of it. What it is is this kind of thing. Some say it's a categorization of no knowledge. I like to think of it as more of types of problems or types of things you can do and what kind of knowledge and how much, how much resources it's going to take. So the width of the thing means it's a little bit easier where the peak is not so much. Typically, what we call a high order thinking skills are things like evaluation, synthesis, and analysis. Can you pull information from different areas together, put it together into a whole? Can you use that? Can you synthesize it? Can you analyze it in new perspectives, new ways? You can come up with theories. Can you actually go in and evaluate things and determine is that the right way to do it or is this its new solution to the problem? Now, there are so many different types of Bloom's taxonomy. I looked it up on this on um, I looked it up online to get this image, and I found so many issues. One of the things a lot of people get confused about this is, is that this un, this second level of comprehension. Many of the Bloom's taxonomies now say that's understanding, and people read understanding means oh it's really easy they'll just be able to understand all my material if I lecture at it. No, if it requires higher order thinking skills, you're going to need to do some student-centered instruction. Because the other thing you want them to know is to have your students realize while they're in the class, then they can ask you a question, is what is, I don't really know what I'm doing here. You know, a lot of times you go into a professor and they're a brilliant speaker, very charismatic, they give this great talk, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And you leave the talk and somebody asks you, what did they cover today? And you're like, not sure, or then you say, oh, yeah, they talked about free body motion and different things like that, and we talked about this and this and this and this, but can you actually use that information beyond memorization? Maybe if you're the special kind of student that can learn from lectures. How many people do you think learn from lectures? Or how many, how many people think they learn from lectures? I turn around, see people raising their hands. Okay, I gotta tell you, break something to you. I'm really sorry to tell you this. You are not your students. You've all received higher degrees or higher education. You, when you were in a classroom, you could learn from lecture. Do you think the majority of students can learn from lecture? We are not our students. We have to constantly remind ourselves that we can't make assumptions of what students can do and learn based on my but based on our own experience of what it was like for us when we were in undergraduate or graduate school or things like that. What is, what is possible for students, what is not possible for students. So keep that in mind. Um, so I want to talk about this other phraseology, uh, this concept of sage on the stage. How many people have heard something like this before? A couple of you? Well, we talk about... <coughs> When you talk about sage on the stage is like an instructor-centered classroom. But this instructor is the sole body of knowledge. That what they say is what you need to learn. And if you're not smart enough to learn from them, you're not smart enough to do it. And so my job is to just convey, to like spout out information, and your job is to absorb it. If your absorption, if it, you know, if you're not very efficient at absorbing, well, that's about you, not about what I'm saying. Because uh, I'm gonna say Jeff here understood what I was saying. He got, he was at one percent, one student out of a hundred that actually can learn from lectures, and he understands it. So I'm okay. One person understood. Good. I know it's understanding. Am I getting feedback from my students to see if they're all understanding? Am I doing anything? No, I'm just spouting out knowledge. I'm going through and I'm just saying things. 
Same thing as you, sort of like I'm doing right now. And so on a contrast, there's the, instruct the classroom-centered thing. So I want you guys to think of this as a spectrum. This is a continuous light spectrum. If you break it up, like if you use a, a prism and you get the rainbow effect coming through this, all different, all different wavelengths are represented. So what the spectrum is saying, you can go from 100% instructor-centered to majority of students active in the classroom. So it's sort of like this, where do I want to be in this, um, where do I want to be in this spectrum? And that's something that changes. Because you may decide, oh, I'm teaching a course for majors. I want to do this. They can handle lectures only. Odds are they can't, but doing that. So before we go on, are there questions? Because I realized I was talking and being a sage on the stage and just not asking questions. So we're asking if there are any questions. So I'm going to turn around, and people's hands will go up as I'm turning around. And they're not going up. OK, sorry, where's, is it going to be in Spanish or English? No, sorry. Are there questions? Notice what I'm doing. I'm allowing time. Because as we learned earlier, as I turn around, hands go up so that I can notice them. All right, so in contrast to the stage on the stage, we often work on this guide on the side. This is an English representation of this phrase. It's sort of pithy to try and get us to be able to understand. You know, I, my job is not to be this, I know everything. I am your master. I'm your Jedi master, and I'm disseminating my information. And you will learn, or you won't, and you will leave. <laughs> you know, so, or I can be on, what can I do to help you learn this material? I, what are your issues? What are your difficulties? Working with each student almost individually in some cases. How do I do, you know, what is going on? How can I adjust what I'm, how do I adjust what I'm teaching? Some instructors do this when students come to office hours. You guys have office hours and students come to office hour or a time where they can come up and just, they know you're going to be in office so that they'll come up and discuss issues they're having in the class. That was the responsibility for that on the student. How likely do you think it is that all students are going to come to your office hours? Not many people at all. So that depends. And so sometimes when you're being the state, a guide on the side is something you can do in the classroom. The point is, is to do all these things you did outside the classroom that put the responsibility on the student happening in the classroom where the responsibility to make them happen is on us as the instructors. And it happens to students. Students' responsibility is to be there and to be open to learning. So I wanted you to do activity number two. And um, I want you to start meeting with your group. And I want you to start thinking about, actually, I'm going to have a switch up. So I want to say, let's see. How many people are doing large courses, like over 150 students? How about 100? OK, one over 100. Anybody else doing over 100? OK, over 75. Going once, going twice. Sorry. Being like an uh, auctioneer here. Um, others. OK, so we have one a large class. OK, what about how many people are doing introductory courses for not for, your, not for your majors, but just introductory courses for general education? Do you know what I'm talking about with that? Yes. Right, so that's something everybody has to take. Do we have courses like everybody has to take? How many people have courses, teach courses? Okay, so I want the people who are doing courses that everybody has to take sort of group up about. Can you stand up, please? She's the one that's doing the general education courses that they have to take. I'm going to let the other, other people split up how they like to split up, but realize there's going to have a lot of diversity in your changes and what you're thinking about, may, your discussion here. I want you to think about what is your type of course. What's the size of your course? Level of the course. Notice I started with size to see if we could group it up and pair you guys up. Didn't quite work because only he's under 100, over 100. Because you're, you're 100, you're special. 88, 90, you're special. Level of the course, is it introductory for everybody? Is it your major? Is it this kind of thing? And then I want you to talk about things like 
All right, do you want to do a small change? What can I do tomorrow? Or do a large change that says, I want to be in the scale-up room. I want to teach my course in the scale room. I want to do this major change and have all my classes be student-centered, active-oriented. So let's break up into our groups again, except for the people that are coming over here. They're doing the courses that are um, general, what we call general education classes. So, you're over, so how many people are doing gen ed, general education for everybody has to take? You, 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 you. See, I'm turning around. People's hands are going up. Mm -hmm. So we have two groups of three for that. So we have the, you two, you two, and then what was the other? There's somebody else. Who is the one that's doing a general ed class? Course for all? Right, that would be more of an introductory. We have a core of classes in um, the United States. Typically, they say the core classes that everybody has to take, like English 101, ma basic math, things like that, or, or courses that are designed for everybody. So you have them take psychology or econ economics, different things like that. So why don't we try and pair the four of you guys up, and then if you guys want to come there or you go there, just talk about these courses. Um, and the rest of you, I want you to work in your teams of three. And I want you to start I want you to start with these questions, and then I want you to start discussing how you would make a small change, and if there's any kind of large change you would like to do. Work with these guys. Yes, I work with them, but um, the, the course that I, uh, I have, the big one, uh, already is in a process of it's a flip classroom uh, course. But I have another course that, that has that's a common lecture, and I would really like to transform it. So, like, I would prefer to work with a smaller course. Okay, so are they guys? So, are you guys doing smaller courses? How would you like to trans how would you think professors should transform their courses? How's that to make it more better for you? Are you a student as well? Are you a student as well? She's she's a student. She's professor. She's a professor. So the three of you work together. Uh, just two small points. Um, here in Athens, we have two situations that maybe you're not familiar with them because it's not common in the American universities. The first one is that when we have, a, a, in a course, we have more than 40 students. We split it and we work three, four different uh, different sections. Uh, sections, and each, each session can has uh, can have a different professor. Right. Okay. Yes. And the second one is that here a professor can teach more than one course, not just one course. Right. So it's something that it's makes us a little bit different maybe from the That's good to know. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. Yes, but focus on what kind of changes yeah. you would want yeah. to do. Yeah, no. Okay, let's spend another next couple minutes wrapping up. I'm going to ask people to share what some of your ideas are. Okay, again, we're going to wrap up. Two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. There's some fruit. There's some fruit, and then you're going to, I'm going to turn it over to you after we do a little bit of discussion. Two minutes. It's okay that you guys are TAs. You're in physics. Sometimes we feel like the questions are not like for us, or we feel like uh, we are here to learn and not to participate. 
You are there to participate because part of your learning is learning how to be a physics instructor. So like if you were to transfer to another PhD school, like if you decided I want to spend a year in the United States or something, or after you get your master's, go to the United States, they expect you to be there and do more teaching. And so one of the things we say, because his role, he has to teach. So who is going to train you to teach in the college camp classroom if not when you're a teaching assistant? Because that's what you learned, right? And then you probably had a, a mentor and... Yeah. Okay, let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. We're going to share our points. Share our things that we're going to do. Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Notice I'm trying to wrap this up. I keep talking louder and I keep talking even though, and then I come and stand over teams that are still talking. And no matter how they're smiling, I'm going to say, ooh, you be quiet and let me talk for a second. <laughs> Notice these kind of management skills. It's sort of learning, but I want you to introduce you to say, hey, I can do that in my class. I just have to do it. But part of it is you being this, um, it's being brave enough to let go of the class and let them have their free reign. OK. So I'm putting on my ears. And so. What's an example? Let's see. What is a small change you can, you could implement tomorrow? Does anybody have any good suggestions for small changes they could implement tomorrow in the class? Yes. A workshop. A workshop. What do you mean by a workshop? A, like an activity with the application of the given lessons, uh, where the students have to solve some things with the advisor of the professor. What are some other ideas of what you could implement tomorrow? Sorry. Yes, sorry. Give them more time for them to respond. Give them more time for them to respond. Count to 12. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. Yeah. Yes. Uh, homework, but not after class, but before class. So, for example, I could ask them to observe something and just bring examples to class and then discuss them in class. So I'm coming over here and so this is a book called Just in Time Teaching and this was created, this is a program that was created at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis and what it is is a ways that you can ask questions and do these things and have them do things beforehand and then sending their responses to you so that you can get the feedback so you can actually adjust what you're actually going to do in lecture or in class based on what the students' responses are or doing things like that. And so we'll be covering, um, for those of you who do lecture-based lecture -based workshops tomorrow, um, I'll be talking about this in there. Okay, other suggestions for... What's that? Clickers, clickers. Getting to know them uh, so that I can relate what I'm teaching to what to their day-to-day -day, um, things and interests. Getting to know your students so you can relate your day-to-day -day things to their interests. And here's one thing I didn't mention. Do you want the number one reason students stay in classes and why they come to classes? The well, number one thing you can do to get people to improve doing these things is learn their names. I once gave a course, I was doing interactive learning, and I was giving back the second exam, and I didn't have to call one student's name. And one student had missed the test and had been skipping class for a few weeks. And he came to my office, and I said, yes, nice to meet you. And he's like, yeah, you don't know who I am. And that's really a big, I realized today, that's a big deal. So I actually do like an extra credit bonus thing now in my courses where I say, oh, you get five extra credit points out of 1,000, not very much, if you come and we just spend 15 minutes talking to each other, getting to know each other, because it makes me a better teacher for doing that. So it's a really great idea. Other suggestions for things we can do tomorrow? What can we do tomorrow? Yes.
so that we get them engaged and interested. Very good. Bringing real world examples of what you want to teach so you can engage the students more. Also help them see why they're doing what they're doing. Other suggestions? Sorry, you're not a suggestion for you're a you're a, or I can't make a suggestion on something they can do tomorrow. Okay, you can make a suggestion, but then I'm going to turn over. Well, just based on the earlier discussion, there was some concern about um, b uh, asking questions and a little bit of bullying and a little bit of authority. So, um, what I usually suggest to my teaching assistants is that when they ask a question, don't talk to, often when, as instructors, we ask questions, we, questions that we don't necessarily want the students to answer. I try to eliminate those from my lectures. But questions I do want them to answer, what I'll do is I'll say, I'll pose a question, and I might, I might say, what are, you going to, what are some things you can do tomorrow? I might have you discuss those in teams of three or four. And then someone presents the group consensus on their answer to the question. And that way there's a lot less risk because it's not their answer, it's their group's answer, and it may not even be their answer. And it notice, may be their teammates. And notice that's what we did. We had you guys pair up, only one person was talking, kinds of things like that. Uh, all right, we need to wrap up now. Are there any uh, last minute questions on this stuff? Again, I hope you're coming back for our later Okay, what did I do there? Did I allow enough time to answer that question for me to listen for your answers? No, bad. Don't do as I do, do as I say. Okay. Any last minute questions? Yes, see, it always works. Are you mean Spanish or English? Espanol. Okay. Eh, gracias. Eh, quisiera mm, de, eh, mirar cómo podemos, porque los docentes y la universidad estamos tratando de, de eh, avanzar en este reto del aprendizaje activo, pero los estudiantes todavía no. O sea, ¿en qué mecanismos institucionales a los estudiantes se les motiva, se les eh, sensibiliza y se logra también de ellos el compromiso? que no sea pues como algo uno a uno el docente, sino que a nivel institucional también se empieza a trabajar con eso, con los representantes estudiantiles, con eh, sus organizaciones estudiantiles, etc. Well, to answer your question, please come back tomorrow to see our pre my presentation all on active learning and how we can, what do we mean by active learning, what do we to try and do this, and how do we actually get the student buy-in? Because you come in here and the student, you know, we say, oh, well, students don't want to learn. They don't want to do it. They just want to sit in the back, read the newspaper, play on their, I, their iPhones, do something like that. That's not really the case. Okay, it's now 11 o'clock. So I am going to say for our session tomorrow, again, on active learning, coming in and doing that. And then we're going to break up in the afternoon where Jeff is going to be talking about what you want to do, kinds of active learning you can do in a scale-up room. Luana is going to be talking about one of these... Um, I'm jealous of this. These learning classrooms with a bunch of these chairs where you can start out like it's a lecture and then turn around and have it be working groups and fun stuff like that. And then I'm gonna be talking about the lecture hall. Uh, later today, um, Jeff right now is gonna be talking about uh, assessing your students. Like how do we judge if the students are learning? What are different ways we can do this? And one of the things we should be aware of when we do this. And then I'm gonna come back in the afternoon and I'm gonna be talking about evaluations. And to give you a brief understanding, the difference between assessment and evaluation. Assessment is what you do, you basically with students. You're assessing what they're learning, you're doing this, you're giving that feedback back to the students. Evaluation is somebody's evaluating or you are evaluating how well you did as an instructor. Or you did it in this course, or how you, how did you meet your goals. So Jeff is going to be talking about learning goals, and then we're going to bring back and do both the assessment and then I'm going to come back and talk about evaluating your learning goals. All right, I'm going to turn my mic off now. I want to thank you guys all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm very happy, was very happy to be here to do this with you guys. So thank you. Thank you.